I have a living specimen to show you. This uh, is an arachnid. The common name for it is uh, vinegaroon. And the reason that they're called vinegaroons is that they have a defense mechanism. They can spray uh, acetic acid from the base of the uh, abdomen here. And it's a deterrent to predators. Uh, it just kind of smells like salad dressing to a person. But to an animal with a sensitive nose, that would be unappetizing. Now, interesting features on these are the uh, abdominal antenna. Rather than a sting like you'd find on a scorpion, there's an antenna here. The, the other interesting feature on these is their antenniform legs. Now, remember, arachnids only have uh, eight legs and no antennas. This one's walking around on six legs. The front legs have become antennas. And because they're modified legs, antenniform legs, they have joints on them and musculature and articulation that an insect would never have in an antenna. So as you can see, they can uh, very accurately explore, touch things with their antennas. Now these are predators, so they roam around at night looking for insects to eat. And apparently scorpions, they like to eat scorpions, small scorpions. And they use these uh, antenna form legs to help them uh, locate prey and, and uh, find, get their way around. Uh, the pedipalps in front, the large pinchers, are kind of primitive. Usually you think of pinchers on a crab or a scorpion, it's like a claw on the end of an appendage. But these are just segments with spines on them. And that is how the claw on a crab or a, a scorpion evolved. Uh, it started with just a, a spine on the appendage and that became modified and refined into an actual pincing claw. So this is kind of the intermediate form of a, of a pedipalp. They're also heavily um, sclerotized or very thick skeleton around the front end and the appendages, which makes sense if they're uh, feeding on scorpions. They're probably impervious to the scorpion stings. Now these are not aggressive. They're, they're kind of creepy looking, but you can hold them. I, they don't pinch you. They don't sting or bite or anything. Uh, and I really enjoy showing these t live ones to children because they're <laughs> such a strange and creepy looking thing, uh, but really uh, very gentle and not dangerous at all. Um, so I'm going to be preparing a, a dead specimen of one of these. It was someone's pet that died. Uh, I don't kill these. I would never kill one to make a specimen. I just think they're just so totally awesome. They're much better to have alive. These are found in the southwestern United States from Arizona across to Florida. Uh, and they're quite common and quite abundant. So uh, a lot of these are collected for the pet trade where people can keep these specimens alive. And um, I think they're really fascinating, really interesting bug to have as a, uh, as a living specimen. I'm going to put this back. I have a couple of specimens of tropical species. These are from Thailand. Uh, this is the same species. I have a, a male and a female. Um, the male has a special little hook on its pedipalp, and I'll show you a prepared specimen of that later. Um, this is how you get them if they're if you buy them from a dealer. Uh, there's a piece of cardstock, a piece of paper towel on that, and uh, cellophane with staples to hold it down. This is just to keep them from getting broken. This one actually is broken. The tail filament is snapped in half, but I'll be able to repair that once I prepare the specimen. Um, this one, the abdomen is pretty round, so this was dried with the gut inside. I suppose they have some sort of dehydrator that they put them in. This one, the abdomen is very flat, and this is another technique that is used sometimes in pr uh, preparing specimens like this. Uh, my guess is that this was opened, the abdomen was cut open on the bottom, and the gut squeezed out. And this will, uh, is actually a good thing because it keeps it from rotting and, and it preserves it better. Although if you prepare this as a specimen, pinned, it, it'll look strange because the abdomen's so flat. So when I prepare this one, I'm going to uh, soften up the abdomen and open it up on the bottom and stuff it with polyester to make the abdomen look more full uh, when I prepare it. This one also has some dust in it, some powder here along the edges you can see. And this is uh, waste from tiny little insects that get inside and eat them up. On a big uh, sturdy specimen like this, it's not going to really cause any problems. But if you get a lot of um, uh, insect damage, uh, they can chew up and destroy the muscles inside and that makes the specimen difficult for it to hold its position once it's dried. These are both from Thailand. 
And then I've got another one from um, Java, uh, Indonesia. It's a different species, a smaller one. This one, the abdomen is full as well, so this one was dried uh, with the gut inside. Um, don't know if that's full grown or not. It might be a full grown example of a small species or it might be a juvenile of a larger one. And then just for fun, I've got one of these, they call them whip scorpions, which is not a very good name because um, it's not a whip and they're not scorpions. They're referring to these long antenniform legs, very, very long on these. And this one's got quite long pedipalps too. This is really an impressive uh, creature once it's uh, pinned up. You can see what an amazing thing it is. This one is from Togo, so I guess that's an African one. Now this is a dead specimen that I got from a friend of mine and it's been soaking in alcohol for a few weeks. I'm going to put it on a paper towel here to dry it out. There we go. I find that the arachnids, scorpions and things like this, uh, they dry out better if they're soaked in alcohol first. And I'm not positive about this, but I do believe they have uh, a waxy coating on the exoskeleton that helps prevent them, keep them from drying out since they're, these are desert species. And uh, the waxy coating, I think, since it keeps them from dry, helps keep them from drying out, it also makes it difficult to dry them as specimens. So I find that soaking them in alcohol uh, I think dissolves that outer layer and helps them dry more quickly. Also, uh, arachnids have a lot of gut inside and they can decompose. Uh, if you have a lot of gut like that, it can decompose and gets really stinky and plus the muscles decompose inside and you want to dry those muscles out, which is what holds the specimen together once it's dried. So by soaking them in alcohol, you uh, suck out some of the water in there, but also sterilize it. It kills all the bacteria inside so that uh, it doesn't decompose and it dries much more quickly. You can see these have very large pedipalps grasping uh, appendages for catching prey. And each of these sections, the last three sections, has a spine. Well, this last section is a spine, but these last two sections have a spine on them. And you can see how this evolved into a uh, a pedipalp. If you look at a lobster or a scorpion and they seem to have this claw attached to the end, it's not really the way it works. The, the second to the last segment of the claw is just a big musculature with a spine on it and then the smaller terminal spine works against that. So that's what makes a claw. And then of course they have these wonderful antenniform legs which are of no use for walking anymore. But I think this is a good example of how if you're an arthropod and you need a tool, an antenna, a claw, a leg, what, and, and, you know, whatever the taste may, may be, uh, and you've a, got a segmented body and each segment has a couple of appendages, you just give them enough millions of years and whatever tool you need, you'll evolve it. So these are really quite remarkable creatures. And then, of course, it's got the antenna on the end, too kind of interesting. Now this one, since it's a, a dead specimen, freshly dead specimen, I'm going to open up the abdomen here and pull the guts out and stuff it with spun polyester so that when it dries the abdomen's nice and round and it looks uh, natural. In order to remove the, the guts, I'm going to uh, cut open the abdomen. Now in these, there's a, like a genital opening right here on the abdomen. And so I'm going to make the incision right in front of that and then I can reach inside and pull the guts out. So I'm going to make a little cut here. There. Now I've got my tweezers. I can reach inside. There's some very fatty tissue in there. Reach inside the abdomen here. The more of the internal gut you can take out, the the faster it'll dry. There'll be less to decompose, and you really get a much nicer specimen that way. Now, there's a lot of sort of liquidy gut in there, and I have a technique to deal with that too. I've got a couple of cotton swabs, and I'm going to 
just shape the end of this swab a little bit, make it a little bit narrower so I can get it up inside. And I should be able to insert this. Find the entrance, there it is. Should be able to insert this inside. There we go. And just kind of twirl it up inside that cephalothorax. It's all the way up into here now. And that'll just kind of scrape out and dry out. And yeah, see, there's a lot of material on there. I'm going to try it again. Need to prop this open with the tweezers first. There we go. This really does make a big difference in how nice the specimen turns out. There we go. Now I'm going to go inside the abdomen and do the same thing, the back part. I think I can get in there. Oh, stretch this out a little bit. There we go. Hmm. I need another hand. There we go. Okay. And just kind of clean that all out. Oh yeah, got a lot out of there. Look at that. I'll go in one more time. Oh yeah, this would be very nice. Okay. Now I've got the abdomen all cleaned out much better. I'm going to get my spun polyester and pack some of this inside the abdomen just to make it nice and full. I'll stretch this out into a little strip. And I grab this with the tweezers on the end insert that into the cavity. There we go. Just pack some of that inside. Oh yeah. And I want some to go up into the front part of it too, so I will um, grab the other end of this and stick some up into the front. Put it all the way up into the cephalothorax just to anchor it in there well. There. Get all that loose ends tucked in, and um, we'll hardly even notice it. Look at that. Yeah, that looks really good. And now we're ready to pin the specimen. We'll put a pin through the uh, cephalothorax here. When we're placing pins, in insects, there's often particular places you want to put them. If there's wings in the way, you have to go to the right. Um, and this one, I can pin it right through the middle. I'm using a fairly um, large pin. I think this is about a four, because it's a pretty big specimen. And I'm, uh, I want the pin to be through the center so that when it comes through the bottom part, it doesn't interfere with the legs. In this case, it won't really, but in some insects, it would. So I'm going to put this through the lower third of the uh, cephalothorax and I want to get the pin lined up so it's straight this way and it's straight you know this way uh, you can go a lot further to having a nicely mounted specimen if you can get the pin in straight it's very important now I look through the bottom and I see the pins coming out right between the legs and it's um, perpendicular to the body there so that's a good placement I want the pins nice and straight now I'm going to use a couple of other large pins and brace the body so at that when I move the legs around, pulling them this and that way, it's not going to spin around on the pin. Um, I guess I'll place the legs first, at least get them roughly in the position I want.
And again, you want it so that the legs look the way they do when the animal's walking around. And having spent some time with living specimens of this, I can get a good sense of what that's supposed to look like. Pull this leg down. Okay. And now the uh, abdomen, I'm going to brace it at the end here so that it's nice and straight. There we go. And I'll have it raised up slightly too, just because that's the way it would look. And then uh, to get the antenna on the back out of the way, I'm going to brace this out. There. Now the pedipalps in the front, you can position them, you know, in different ways. Um, it's nice to be able to show the features. Uh, the tip of this one is kind of clamped, and I want that out so I can see it better. It's kind of stiff. There it is. So I'm going to think I'm going to position these just slightly curved, and I can use a pinned brace between those tips <coughs> and bring it up into position. That looks pretty good. And you use pins to brace them. And you can always go back and fine-tune it more later. And then the antenniform legs, I want these up, held up. They would hold them up like this so that you can see the articulations. And I'll start at the base segment and sort of brace that where I want it. And I try to go for symmetry. I just like the way that looks. And then I'll go to the second segment here and brace that the way I'd like it. And I'll do the same on the other side. And again, don't get too bogged down in the details right now. You can fine tune it later. And then the third segment, I want them up. There we go. And then um, the last little bit on the end has an articulation on it. That would be the tarsus in a leg. And this one's broken a little bit, but that's okay. And I'm going to want to have that articulated too so you can see that it has that little section on the end. Yeah, sort of like that. Now all I need to do is um, fine tune this a little bit to make sure it's nice and symmetrical. I can see that this petty palps a little too much towards its center. So I'll move that a little bit and that's better. Yeah. And now these legs, I'll put a pin at the base at the tarsal segment right here. Try to bend that a little bit so you can see it. And then I'll lift the leg up a little bit with a pin like this. Place the foot, the tarsus, and lift the leg up a little bit. Yeah, that looks good. And then the one in the back, too, I'll lift this one up a little bit. Oops. There we go. That looks pretty good. Now we'll do the same to the other side. And a pin to lift this leg up a little. And then this foot, tarsus, in the same spot, and lift the leg up a little. And the front one, I'm going to have that one there, and brace it. And I'm going to go to this side, and pull this one forward a little bit. And then brace it. There, that looks pretty good. So the abdomen's a little bit twisted. There, that's better. And uh, lastly, just the antenniform legs. I'm going to bring this one back slightly so it looks the same. And uh, this one forward a little bit. That looks pretty good. Actually, it looks pretty good. i bring this one forward a little bit. And then uh, brace the end down slightly. 
Uh, this one needs to come forward a little bit. And this one needs to go in a little bit. There, that actually looks quite good. This pedip helps a little too low. So I'm going to lift it slightly. Bring the end in. There, that looks pretty good. I want this tail to be nice and straight. So I'm just going to take the tweezers and grab it and just kind of shape it. There we go. And I can use pins to adjust that too. It has a slight bend in it right here. So I'll just use a pin to straighten that out. There we go. Yeah, that looks quite good. Maybe slight more adjustment here on the front one. Yeah, I like that. Okay, and that's all there is to it. Uh, again, these may take a little longer than an insect to dry. I think the other ones took about a week. Um, if you're in a hurry, you can use a hair dryer and a small hair dryer and just blow some hot air on it. Uh, and that will speed up the drying process, but um, it's probably not that good for the specimen either to heat it up like that. So. Uh, these are a couple of specimens that I prepared mm, about two weeks ago and pinned them up. So I'm going to pull the pins out now. And you can see how I use the pins to support the uh, legs and different structures to get them in the position that I want them to be. Uh, the front pedipalps or pinchers on these are very interesting. And, uh, you, you know, I position these more open so you could see them and these more closed. You can sort of put them in whatever position you like. But I, I, most important to me is that whatever position the appendages are in, it would be a position that they would have if they were alive. Um, sometimes you see these mounts, you know, where the legs and stuff are stretched all out flat. And it's like you can see all the pieces that way, but it's not anything like what they would look like uh, when they were alive. And and I just don't think that um, that really is of any use. It's much better to see what the animal looks like when it's alive. Yep, very nice. The uh, antenna on the abdomen is broken a little bit. This would be a slightly longer. And if I had another specimen with a complete uh, antenna part here, I might glue it on if I had a section to attach. As long as it's the same species and it's done correctly, I don't think there's any problem with that. All right, then now I'll put them in the box. I do have a specimen, a different species of these uh, hook scorpions. Uh, this is a South American species. The one I showed you in the package was um, African. Uh, this one has much shorter pedipalps, uh, really long antenna legs. Look at that. I'm not really happy with the way this one's mounted. I'm going to redo it. And these are the specimens that I have in my teaching collection. And I have the, uh, this is the one from the United States here, Gigantius. And this is the Asian species that I had and unmounted on the card. Yeah, look at these little weird little hooks. It's like a little extension, the little flat piece on the end. Uh, and apparently those are on the males and not on the females, so I don't know what that is. And this is another of the uh, Indonesian ones. This could be the male of the, the other one. And so then, this is the species that uh, we saw earlier that was from Togo, the African uh, one. And you can see it has really extraordinarily long uh, pedipalps. That's quite a reach on that with some really bristly looking hands on the end. And of course it also has the long antenna form legs on it. 
Now, what's interesting is that this is an amblypingid, and um, and then this one is from South America, another amblypingid. So, what does that tell us about the history of this uh, group of animals? Uh, South America and Africa were once connected, and that's how old these uh, the ancestors of these are. Uh, there's no way they could swim across the Atlantic Ocean, so uh, that's uh, one of the ways that geology helps us date um, the uh, history of uh, species.